Thank you, Orna. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, Orna, I would need permission to share my screen, please. Yeah. Okay. So, hello, everyone, and thank you very much for, for attending this uh, first a Smart City Training Series of 2021. Can you confirm if you can see correctly my screen? Thank you. So um, some of you already participated in some trainings last year. We have changed a little bit the format. We have decided to go a bit shorter this year. So we all uh, suffer a bit less of Zoom fatigue uh, after these trainings and also hoping, hoping to concentrate in just 20, 30 minutes, all the information that you need to know to begin to to address some of the challenges that you might find when trying to work on a smart cities or digitalization project. As you know, many of you already know us, but for the ones that you don't, uh, we are the UNDP Global Center for Technology, Innovation and Sustainable Development. Our mandate is to accompany our country offices and beneficiary governments in the use of technology and innovative methodologies to uh, implement development, sustainable development projects. We just don't work in smart cities and digitalization. We also work on sustainable agriculture and how to integrate digital tools into agricultural projects and also on sustainable finance and how to find ways to make these ventures having a social impact to grow and be more and more impactful. So we are a center providing support in all these three uh, areas, specifically on innovation and technology and how to use it for this matter. Uh, from the smart cities and digitalization service um, focus area, we provide several kinds of, of services. One of these is the building expertise and part of these uh, activities is precisely this training series, but we also organize like closed door master classes to government officials, to practitioners, etc. So please, if you are interested in exploring possibilities, uh, talk with us, so send us an email and we will be really happy to discuss with you how we can help. We also generate communities of practice on a specific topics, gathering experts, um, city officials, public, um, public uh, officials, private sector, in order to discuss about the specific topics that are of vital importance in the domain of smart cities and digitalization. We also share knowledge, knowledge pieces, blog articles, best practices. So also if you have best practices that you would like to showcase, we would be really happy to hear about that. And also we do a smart city delivery. We provide technical assistance to governments through our country offices on how to shape their projects and get the best uh, approach to it so that it can be successful. So again, thank you very much. Today, we will be talking about digital connectivity. Um, in our work, we consider that the foundations of digital transformation are the ones that you can see in this slide. So in order to do a proper digital transformation, you need to think about the dif very different aspects and each of them is important. Some of them imply more infrastructure, some others are uh, more related to governance. I'm not going to go in depth into each of them, but just to highlight the importance of connectivity, the infrastructure and the connectivity and how we provide this uh, capacity to our citizens to uh, participate in the, digital, in the digital world today. So, Callum will be going much more in depth into this topic today. We again welcome you very much all here. And now I think that Urna will be, will be popping out uh, a survey to all of you to get some insights from your side. So thank you very much and over to you, Callum. Perfect, thanks, Helda. And are you happy for me to get started? Yeah. Um, just gonna mention that we have a survey before Callum's session. Um, if you could um, go into the chat box, there's a link to the survey. It's a real-time survey, so if you could just answer to this question, what does digital connectivity mean to you? Uh, we should be able to get your responses up here. Okay, we already have some good responses.
Okay, we have a lot of responses from you guys. Thanks very much for responding to our question. And it seems like a lot of you think about digital connectivity in terms of access, integration, accessibility, and internet. And some of the other um, topics include the integrity, networking, opportunities, and safety, governance, high-speed internet as well. So I think a uh, column is going to reflect on this uh, topic when he does his presentation. So take it away, Callum. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, I, I think some of you are in the right place. That's all good. Share my screen. Anna, can you see my slides? Better. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Um, it's great to have you all here and um, a real privilege to be, to be in front of you. A um, quick bit about my background. So I joined UNDP about a year ago or so. So I lead our programs at the UNDP Global Center, um, the three areas that Elba mentioned. Um, prior to working at UNDP, I was at GSMA, the Mobile Phone Trade Association, um, where I led a lot of work around kind of last mile connectivity, digital identity, um, mobile money, and, and so on. Um, prior to that as well, I've done quite a lot of work around the connectivity space, including working on 3G, 4G, uh, 5G pilots, Internet of Things, and also full fiber. And that's kind of uh, gone against a whole kind of spectrum of connectivity from uh, policy making. Um, I led a lot of the UK legislation around connectivity, on the ground delivery, and then also training of policymakers um, around the world. Um, I also currently, alongside UNDP, am co chair of one of the World Economic Forum's uh, task force on digital infrastructure. And I'll talk about some of the policy work on that in a moment. That could be relevant to, to all of you. Um, and also sit on the Mayor of London's uh, infrastructure advisory panel. And as several of you may have noticed, I also talk uh, too fast. So I'll try to slow down. But it's, this is something that I'm very uh, passionate about. So I won't spend too much time here because uh, you're all, I'm sure, very familiar with the SDGs. Um, but connectivity is really fundamental for every SDG. Everything from um, Internet of Things to support life on, um, on land or below water, so SDGs 14 and 15, through to the role of connectivity in last mile access, as some of you mentioned in the, in the Menti poll, so tackling things like no poverty, uh, gender equality, um, and also, as we've seen in the context of COVID, the importance of, of connectivity for quality education and remote learning as well. Uh, as Elba mentioned, connectivity is very much the kind of literal foundations of a smart city. Um, and for us, the lowest smart city is about technology and innovation. And that innovation includes things like nature-based solutions and local knowledge. Um, it's a real driver of public service delivery, uh, lives and livelihoods, um, and also private sector services as well. It's also quite a complex space. Um, what we're going to focus on, on for, for this webinar is very much on the kind of supply side. So working upstream with where uh, operators are, as opposed to looking at the, the demand side of connectivity. So things like handset uh, affordability or, or usage um, or digital literacy. We can do that in a, in a separate session if there's interest in that. In terms of what connectivity looks like, um, it's quite a long value chain. It's everything from submarine cables all the way to very last mile and very rural access. Um, but largely it's split between things like wired infrastructure, which is often fiber optics, and wireless infrastructure which is often mobile, um, but also things like satellite um, as well. It's also quite a, a complex policy area to get into as well, particularly when we start moving more and more towards the, the rural context. So this is some work that I led at GSMA, um, where if you start looking at deploying in a rural environment, particularly in very remote villages and towns, the cost of deployment is sometimes uh, three times a, a third or so higher. But unfortunately, the revenues that an operator will get from those sites are 10 times lower. So this is exactly why we need to talk about the kind of nexus between the private sector and the public sector, things like public-private partnerships and wider collaboration, because last mile access won't happen by the market itself. And there are also very fundamental challenges still of inclusion. Often we focus on the, the demand side here. So things like the, the GSMA mobile gender gap report, which highlights that for many, many countries, uh, women and girls still don't have access to mobile devices. They don't have access to digital skills. They don't have high digital literacy. But I think on a more normative level, um, we're also seeing real challenges of inclusion as well. So the map um, on the left-hand side is um, from a year or so ago, I think. Um, but it's essentially maps where all the kind of 5G trials and research are happening. 
And as you can see, a lot of this is concentrated in the global north. When we're talking about uh, next generation connectivity or technology, it has to be a truly global conversation. And that's what a lot of the work of, that we're doing at the Global Centre is about, is trying to make it a global discussion and ensure that kind of smart cities and the technology and the standards that underpin them are also defined globally as well, and not just in the richer countries. So we don't have too much time today, but I'd like to walk you through um, three different examples that could be relevant in your, your smart cities or your kind of wider connectivity work. So the first is focusing on the so when we do uh, connectivity rollouts, which in an urban space are often wired, so things like fiber optics or even wireless, like installing uh, mobile masks, a lot of the cost and complexity is actually in the, the rollout of those networks. So digging up streets or placing infrastructure on buildings. So increasingly we're seeing more and more what are called dig once policies. Um, this is quite popular in the US, across Europe, um, and also in places like Nigeria increasingly as well. The whole point of this is to try and um, rationalize and coordinate infrastructure works. So connectivity providers can work alongside other utility providers, um, local authorities, but also alongside property developers. So you're not building uh, buildings that have no connectivity in from day one. So this is, we've been doing a lot of work uh, in collaboration with the World Economic Forum on this. And um, we've actually developed a model policy that any city around the world can use. Um, and we're kind of working now with an initial cohort of 30 cities to try and implement that policy and provide training as well. So I'll share the policy um, and a link to it as well after, after this session. Um, when we start moving slightly outside of the urban space, so getting into smaller towns or peri-urban environments, um, often it's about trying to deliver infrastructure, um, but also balance the usage and maintenance of public assets. Um, in many countries that we work in, uh, government uh, legitimacy and government budgets don't stretch too far outside the capital city. So working in partnership with the private sector can be very, very important. In this context, we see something called public sector asset use. So this is about leveraging public buildings or public assets like things like public toilets in India to host, uh, it could be Wi-Fi hotspots, it could be as a base for fiber optic infrastructure, or it could be a base for mobile mast as well. And the benefits for this are firstly that you can roll out connectivity faster to populations. Um, but also local authorities can save on the kind of maintenance and upkeep of public assets as well through getting the, the private sector mobile operator or connectivity provider to pay for the maintenance and upkeep of those assets. So as we move into the rural space, this is where innovation becomes really, really important. Um, so the big, when we get into more rural areas, we probably won't be using wired infrastructure anymore. Um, it will often be wireless infrastructure. Um, this is because the, the sheer cost and complexity of, of rolling out fiber optic cables um, in outside of cities is, is very, very high. But even when we're rolling out mobile network infrastructure, there's still a lot of cost and complexity involved. Um, and the three main asset aspects of mobile infrastructure that are especially uh, complex and especially costly as well. So the first is about power. Um, often mobile networks rely on diesel generators, which are very expensive to run. Um, obviously very energy inefficient, very polluting as well. Um, and things like diesel are really um, opportunities for theft and damage as well in more rural environments. So we're increasingly looking at uh, solar power, renewable energy. Um, there's places like Cellcard in Cambodia, the mobile operator there, who have built enormous uh, solar panel um, and renewable energy usage for their, for their mobile network. But again, this is still a kind of a very emerging area. Um, and there are very real issues with supply chains as well, um, in terms of how do you get solar panels into some of these environments, um, how do you build and maintain them, um, and also how do you stop them getting stolen um, as well. The second element that tends to be quite costly is something that we call backhaul, which is how do you get data from a local network, which might be a, a local tower in a, in a town or a village, back to the core network. So you can send a text message or data between one person in the town and in a, into another town as well. Um, backhaul historically has been using things like satellites, which are very expensive and, and very slow, but increasingly we're seeing more innovation and more technology happen around microwave technology as well. And then the final element, which is also very expensive, is what sits on top of a mobile mast, so your kind of base station. And this is what provides your kind of fundamental connectivity. What we're seeing more and more around the world is uh, more simplified infrastructure, um, including modular infrastructure, 
and things that could be cited on telegraph poles or very small poles, as opposed to requiring extensive civil works and infrastructure. So again, another way of trying to save money through leveraging innovation. When we get into very rural settings as well, like, like the picture we've got here, we can also start looking at leveraging um, public sector buildings um, to try and accelerate network deployment too. And then finally, when we get into incredibly rural places, um, this is often places where the private sector will not go. Um, there is no commercial feasibility. There's very uncertain uh, return on investment. So often you're looking at either government subsidies, um, very significant public-private partnerships, recently what we call community networks. Um, this is a concept that has got a lot of traction across Latin America um, and has particularly accelerated in the past few years when technology and infrastructure has become more simple, um, more modular, and also kind of plug and play. Um, and essentially what you're doing here is you're getting local communities to build and manage their own telecoms networks. Um, and a lot of these can be managed centrally, so you can do all the kind of uh, data usage or the calibration from a major city. And then locally, the village or the community members are responsible for upkeep, day-to-day um, -day maintenance, very kind of basic tasks, and also just protecting it from damage and safety and, and theft as well. The benefits of this are quite exciting. So beyond just providing uh, connectivity, which as we all know is a, is a really kind of fundamental and important catalyst for growth, um, it also allows people to build some very significant skills. That includes things like engineering, uh, business management skills, um, and also kind of wider range of innovation skills that could be very important in the digital economy as well. And again, happy to share via email after the webinar, some resources on the community network side um, from both the kind of policy side and also the more kind of technical side as well. Beyond those areas, we're also seeing a lot of uh, new technology coming up and also new business models. On the new technology, we're seeing more and more what we call high altitude platforms, which are increase, increasingly things like balloons, like the, the super tower on the left hand side there. Um, sadly, a few weeks ago, we saw that Loon, which was a, a spin out from Google, um, stopped operating. Um, it'd been running a number of commercial trials across Kenya, but it looks like it wasn't a financially sustainable uh, endeavor, but there is still more and more innovation happening in that space. And then also in the past few years, we've seen um, the cost of getting satellites into orbit drop significantly. And that's led to more and more connectivity satellites in orbit, um, and also more and more of them providing better services as well. Historically, in the satellite side, um, satellite connectivity used to be very slow and very expensive, um, but now we're seeing very real changes in business models, um, in costs for the consumer, um, and also increased experience for the consumer as well. So satellite is, is a really kind of promising area, particularly when we look at more rural connectivity. Particularly when we look at that kind of very last mile context as well, um, more rationalized business models are also coming to the fore. We're seeing things like telecom providers and others also providing energy or financial services, um, pay as you go solar and so on, basically to try and make their investments in a very rural context um, feasible or to provide opportunities for broader return on investment. So investing in the infrastructure could be at a loss. But if they can provide services on top of that infrastructure, which might be mobile money, it might be providing electricity to charge devices, um, there's still opportunities there for financial sustainability. And then just finally, um, a few kind of concluding thoughts. Um, the first is often we hear a lot about 5G in the context of connectivity. Um, and even the most hardcore proponents of 5G, such as GSMA, the Mobile Phone Trade Association, which is their, their graph that you can see on the right hand side, um, as you can see by that, even in the most positive light, in the next five years or so, the majority of the world will still be using a 4G connection. And in many of the countries in which we're working, 2G and 3G will still be phenomenally important. So this is about very much getting the basics right. We need to be future looking, we need to be looking at 5G, but we also need to be making sure that we're providing connectivity to the last mile and ensuring that we're meeting the needs and realities of the billions of people that still have no connectivity. With that in mind, there are three, I think, really important concepts to take away from this. The first is the concept of meaningful connectivity. This is something that our friends at the Alliance for Affordable Internet are, are working on very significantly, but meaningful connectivity is connectivity that meets the needs and realities of people. It's not just about providing very basic connectivity, but about providing them with connectivity that they can use for their, their lives, their education, their work, and their personal matters as well. Similarly, it's about focusing on what we call a healthy internet. And this is what the Mozilla Foundation is focusing on as well. 
Um, a healthy internet is tackling things like ensuring net neutrality. So ensuring that big companies don't dominate in providing infrastructure and that we don't uh, divide or put barriers in place across the internet either. And then finally, particularly when we talk about connectivity, it's about moving beyond just access as well. Often we think about access as a very binary element that someone will suddenly go from not having a phone or not having a, a connection to having one. But often in some of the places that we work, um, a, that's not a linear pathway. That phone might be stolen. It might be sold to um, get you know, very, very kind of crucial household income. But also we need to be looking at beyond just access as well. So looking at how people are using and engaging with Particularly with women and girls, um, we're not going to build digital literacy in, in that population, a more marginalized population, if we just look at providing basic access. Digital literacy comes from longer term engagement, so being able to play with a device, being able to get used to it, being able to make mistakes on it. And you're not going to be able to build that level of digital literacy just by having access to a device one day a month or, or similar. Finally, as well, we're seeing some real kind of fundamental and structural challenges that are requiring uh, very strong public and private partnerships. That includes about providing financing to connectivity rollouts, um, including around subsidies or universal service funds, but also about moving beyond the lower hanging fruit as well. So we see a lot of middle income countries are now shaping digital infrastructure strategies, which are very beneficial, but they're also very hard to implement because it's a real nexus of policy, regulation, the private sector, and requires very focused and very longer term efforts as well. And sometimes that does actively conflict with the kind of shorter term policy or political objectives that we see in some countries as well. So that was quite a, a run through of a few kind of connectivity topics. I'm happy to pick up questions now. We'll also follow via email with uh, a number of resources um, and also happy to, to email back and forth as well if you've got any particular questions. Thank you. Just had a horrible moment there. I thought I was on mute. It's been one of those people. <laughs> was, uh... We are here, Carol. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Orna, did we get any, any questions? Um... So we didn't get any questions at the moment, but um, a participant. Okay, participants, feel free to ask any questions you have in the chat box. If not, uh, we can move on to our another Menti survey, which I'm gonna share the same, it's gonna be the same um, link. I'm gonna reshare it in the chat box. If you can go ahead um, and then select the next question to answer, uh, that would be great for us. It's about what we could cover next in our session. In the meantime, while participants are answering this, this, uh, this survey, Karum, um, what do you think that is the first element that we need to consider when we're thinking about developing uh, a connectivity strategy in a small city? So what, are the, what is the first thing that the public authority needs to think about? Uh, it's a good question. Um, so I think from, from my experience, thanks for the gift on the screen there. Uh, Anna. Um, the big one is about data. So actually being able to understand the scale of the problem. So looking at where there are gaps or issues um, or where there are particularly kind of marginalized populations. Um, and through understanding that, you can then start identifying what are the most, um, the, the most priority kind of interventions, which might be policy, it might be infrastructure, it might be something else. So just, I think, focusing on data Things like GIS mapping to look at where connectivity is and isn't available um, are really important foundations. Are there any uh, specific partners that can help us on uh, these cities to obtain this information? Or yeah, it depends a lot on the country, but um, many countries now have um, widely available data um, on connectivity, which might be kept in a regulator, which is often made available by open data. Um, there are also bodies like the Internet Society. Uh, the Alliance for Affordable Internet and also GSMA that publish a lot of useful data on this um, and also our, our friends at the World Bank too. Um, a lot of our work as well at the Global Centre is about trying to build the data infrastructure in many cities and, and countries. So I think this is a very much a kind of longer term uh, priority for, for UNDP as well. Thank you. Okay, we have another question in the chat box column for you. Um, 
Lethia to ask, um, could you please share your reflection regarding governance innovation? How will government utilize digitalization and smart cities to improve governance? It's a really, really useful question. Um, and I think this is exactly what connectivity can deliver as well, um, is that kind of citizen engagement. So we see a lot of things around kind of crowdsourcing and collective intelligence. So actually we've just wrapped up a, a multi-city challenge across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, where it was all about trying to engage with um, citizens and to, to try and define and, and drive a more collaborative form of governance. Um, and it's all about trying to go where citizens are and increasingly that is on, um, and that's increasingly places like, it might be Facebook, uh, it might be WhatsApp. Um, so trying to leverage those um, elements to improve governance is, is really fundamental. Um, I think another aspect that sometimes gets forgotten though is uh, the whole feedback loop. So if we are getting data from citizens or we are asking for their input into policies or into governance, it's also about circling back to those citizens to explain how we use that data, um, how their input was positive, how it made a difference, um, and to try and foster more of a kind of what two-way dialogue than just kind of broadcasting out to, to the public. So I'll, just, I'll pick up the next question yeah. around- Thank uh, you for the uh, answer, Colin. Yeah. Um, so I'll pick up the next one, which is about, um, do I know any success cases where UNDP or other UN agencies are able to integrate or offer connectivity to government counterparts? So we've done um, UNDP. Um, we do a lot of work, at, at, I think, most elements of the development journey. So sometimes it might be in a very uh, conflict or humanitarian context. So things like pop-up networks um, to provide immediate connectivity to uh, displaced populations are one part. Um, we also have very extensive procurement abilities at UNDP. So in things like uh, digital justice, we've procured uh, cell towers to provide uh, connectivity to, to courtrooms um, and also worked very closely with cities on uh, planning and deployment of fiber and others. I think where we don't get into it um, is when we get into kind of larger deployments and that's where places like the World Bank and the IFC would step in, particularly when we're talking about um, investments that have ticket sizes of like $100 million for, uh, uh, for countrywide or citywide fiber networks or 4G networks. That's when we look to, to work with IFC, the World Bank, and also the private sector um, as well. And then in the UN space, the ITU, the International Telecoms Union, um, they do a lot of work around policy, regulation, global governance um, as well. And I think the final question from uh, Anahita, um, around sharing some resources. Yep, we're very happy to share resources via um, email. We also have a website we're updating all the time that we'll point um, to in that email. Um, and also please do, as um, Erna just mentioned, add in any topics you're particularly interested in in the context of smart cities or digitalization onto the survey and we can try and pick them up in a, in a future course as well. Okay, so. Thank you very much. I think that we are uh, two minutes past the two minutes past the the, the final uh, the finalization of the workshop. Thank you very much also for all your suggestions um, on topics to address in the future webinars. Thank you a lot, Callum, for your presentation and for these insights. I think that it has been super interesting and uh, an approach that we all needed to 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 begin to think about connectivity. And to all, please answer the, the, the evaluation survey that we will send you after this, this webinar with uh, the additional resources and looking forward to meeting you in the next webinar in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. Thank you.